thank you for joining us today on Netfa. Welcome to the program. I'm Ayola Kasim. E-waste volumes are surging globally. They grew by 21% in the five years up to 2019, when 53.6 million metric tons of e-waste were generated. For perspective, 2019's e-waste weighed as much as 350 cruise ships placed end-to-end -to, -end to form a line 125 kilometers long. This growth is projected to continue as the use of computers, mobile phones, and other electronics continues to expand. Unfortunately, only 17.4% of e-waste produced in 2019 reached former management or recycling facilities. That's according to the most recent global e-waste statistic partnerships estimates. The rest was illegally dumped overwhelmingly in low or middle income countries where it is recycled by informal workers. Appropriate collection and recycling of e-waste is key to protect the environment and reduce climate emissions. Some are getting the process right, and today on Edfile, we start with a story from Dubai, where a company is making a difference. Just stay with us. Envarsov, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a company established in 2004 in the UAE started with an idea of recycling of refrigerant gases. Refrigerant gases are the, all the gases that make the, the chillers or the AC work. And those gases get contaminated with oil and moisture, so we need to replace them. Uh, but, but they are very hazardous, so somebody has an idea, why don't we recycle them? So they start the idea of recycling gases and then moved from recycling gases to Specialized waste. Specialized waste is everything that has to do with anything that expired goods to uh, last line fashion, which we don't need anymore, which we're going to destroy, uh, overstock, uh, cars, uh, anything that you can think of that need to be destroyed. So a lot of companies have those items and we, we, we destroy for them. And then third started also the idea of e-waste because the, by 2006-07 the mobile phone were into, uh, you know, everybody had a mobile phone, everybody started buying mobile phone, renewing the old mobile phone, what to do with the old ones, so the idea started, let's recycle them. We went into the direction again of e-waste at the third department, we kept the first two. Envarusense has since grown to be one of the world's largest electronics recyclers. At this stage, actually, we are recovering iron. So what happens typically in any appliance, you will have iron, you will have plastic, you will have PCBs. So each of the modules are so designed that they have a primary output. Like this module is primarily for iron. Doesn't mean that we cannot get anything else out. But primarily, it is going to be giving us an iron output, a clean output. The rest of it may be a clean picking, or maybe we'll have to be rerouted back to the shredder. That's how the architecture is, that we will re-shred it and then again re-process uh, it. So if you look at this belt, you see it's a clean iron coming. In case there's an impurity, he will shift it here. Its plant is capable of processing 14 times more e-waste than it does today. Any product that comes into its processing facility is recycled to a rate of 96 to 98 percent. So now you have an absolute classic example of recycling, clean iron, clean plastic. According to the United Nations sponsored project finding, the average United Arab Emirates resident generates 17.2 kilograms of e-waste every year, most of which contain harmful toxins such as arsenic, cadmium and mercury. Developed countries, in countries where everything is set, most, lot of people, not most of them, a lot of people take them to take everything to the specialized units where you can bins, you can put the e-waste there. In countries who are in, in, in the path of development, like the GCC Africa, we don't have that facility. So what you do, either you throw them in a bin, it's cheap, or you just put them in a drawer. So at a certain moment when you move from a house to a house, you have like 60 cables and 20 phones. Where did this come from? 40 years of buying and buying, what to do with them, let's dump them. Those are, if we think about it, are the raw materials to produce new phones if we recycle them correctly. 
we don't, they go to the landfill and they stay there for 1,200 years because they will not be dissolved by Mother Earth. They will stay there as pollution, as a contamination to Mother Earth. Addressing this concern, the facility aims to process the entire range of waste electrical and electronic equipment from consumer and industrial to commercial. Some of them include air conditioners, batteries, computers, household appliances and mobile phones. It targets e-waste from different countries across the Middle East and Africa and can recycle up to 98% of the material from an electronic device into raw materials, which are then sold to manufacturers in the automobile, IT and construction industries. Many are sizes of plastic, metal. First we take, we crush everything, take the plastic out and then we take the ferrous metal, more ferrous metal, steel, silver. The end of the line here you will have aluminium, pure aluminium at 100% pure plastic in different sizes at 100%, gold, silver, steel, uh, all the grades. We have more than 18 different kinds of uh, material coming out and all of them are recyclable because they are 100% clean. Plastic is only plastic, steel is only steel, aluminium is only steel. So the, 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 the processing facility we are working with, smelters, they take it as a raw material. Instead of taking it out of the, gr of the ground, they buy it from us and they can use it directly in terms of making new cars, new laptops, new phones. The crude dismantling and processing of e-waste with rudimentary techniques without proper personal protective equipment and containment infrastructure pose an immense risk to humans, animals and the environment, even in very minute quantities. Among the components of e-waste are bits of silver, copper, golden still. The global average recovery of these precious metals is only 10 to 15 percent due to the non-availability of viable recovery technologies resulting in huge loss of valuable metals and environmental accumulation causing pollution. Are we fully occupied? Are we fully in, in production? No. We need more waste. So we need more waste. Do we need to generate more waste? No. There is enough waste. There is more than 53, more than 53 million of e-waste generated worldwide. If we get only 1 million out of it, it's a lot. So we don't need new waste, but we need the waste to come to the processing facility. Meaning people are the one who can make that happen or not. Domestic people, when you have a cable, don't throw it in the trash bin, but take it to a response to plant space, to, 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 to an area where e-waste can be uh, uh, disposed of. Latest smartphones in the market have a much shorter life cycle than that of their predecessors, which inevitably lead to a larger quantity of e-waste. Experts say due to the connected nature of the world we now live in and the central role devices play in it. On an individual level, our carbon footprint has grown tenfold. And what happens to that used smartphone, laptop, old TV and other e-waste? Africa holds the lowest rate of formal e-waste recycling in the world, only 1% of binned devices are redirected to recycling plants. We need from government, which is already there, but we need it to be applied, is EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility. For each product that's being produced, the producer needs to pay a fee to the government to dispose of the goods. This is being applied all over the world. In some countries not, Africa, Middle East, so it needs to be applied. This is what we need from government. We are discussing with the UAE uh, that law, is being discussed now. Uh, in some uh, African countries is being uh, uh, applied and discussed. Our, uh, Europe, USA, it's already applied since uh, 20 years. So there's what we need from government. From domestic household, for example, here, we need from facility management to put a bin in the, in the, in the villas, you know, in the, in the, the community center to people to, so they can facilitate for them to collect e-waste. What we need for domestic to be aware to don't throw it in the bin, but just to segregate it what we need from, uh, from the people who are remotely, uh, are remotely uh, living remotely and they don't have any availability to bring us the U.S. to call us and we will come, go and pick it up for them, don't throw it. Thanks to their overall low cost, informal recyclers play a competitive role in the international market, where scrap and component buyers often choose them over their registered competitors. Countries such as Nigeria, Kenya and Ghana are still very reliant on informal recycling. 
a study conducted in Nigeria shows that approximately 60 to 71,000 tons of used electrical and electronic equipment were imported annually into Nigeria through the two main ports in Lagos in 2015 and 2016. It was found that most of the imported used e-waste was shipped from developed countries like Germany, UK, Belgium, United States and many more. Additionally, a basic functionality test showed that, on average, at least 19% of devices were non-functional. In 2019, total of 461 kilotons, with a 2.3 kilogram per capita of e-waste was generated in Nigeria. The Global E-Waste Monitor 2020 report found that the fate of 82.6%, that is around 44.3 metric tons of e-waste generated in 2019 is uncertain. And its whereabouts and environmental impact varies across the different regions. The statistics show that in 2019, the continent with the highest collection and recycling rate was Europe with 42.5%, Asia ranked second at 11.7%, the Americas has 9.4% and Oceania has 8.8%. Africa on its part had the lowest rate at 0.9%. Continent-wise, it's quite simple. If you go by the total weight generated per continent, it's definitely Asia, simply because there is also the biggest world population. But if we go by per capita, then it's Europe by far leading, globally speaking, with countries like Norway, etc., generating more than 25 kilograms per capita. Uh, Germany uh, and others are around 19 kilograms per capita per year. China, with 10.1 million tons, was the biggest contributor to e-waste, and the United States was second with 6.9 million tons. India, with 3.2 million tons, was third. Either it is electric cars, artificial intelligence, 3D printers, uh, driverless cars, whatever robots, we will produce more and more e-waste. So this is a really alarming sign. We found out that in 2019, we produced roughly 54 million tons of e-waste, which is more or less the weight of 350 cruise ships like the size of Queen Mary II. It's a huge amount. Is that we expect this quantity of 53 million tons per, uh, per year will rise to 74 by 2030. So for the next 10 years, we expect roughly a 35% increase. It is too much. It's too much since we are not already managing properly the current waste streams. I believe that we have all the possibilities, we have all the tools, all the technologies to have a circular economy in the next 20, 30 years, and a wasteless future. However, we lack the governance systems to put them in place, coordinate, and stimulate these activities. So, although we have all the possibilities here, right now for a wasteless future, I think we are heading for a wasteful planet. Bye -bye. 50 tons of mercury lies within all of the e-waste that officials have lost track of, and much of that was likely released into the environment, as according to the report. Mercury is a neurotoxin that affects the brain and can impair the cognitive development of children. There is also lost gold in all that trash. $57 billion worth of gold, copper, iron, and other minerals could be mined from last year's e-waste alone. Making use of that wasted material could also lessen the environmental damage from mining for new materials. Small electronics like video games, electronic toys, toasters and electric shavers made up the biggest chunk of 2019's e-waste. The next largest piece of pie, with 24%, was made up of large equipment like kitchen appliances and copy machines. This group includes discarded solar panels, which aren't a huge problem yet, but could pose issues as the relatively new technology gets older. Screens and monitors created about half as much trash 
as large equipment but still amounted to close to 7 million metric tons of e-waste in 2019. One of the reasons, you know, why the amount of e-waste is growing so rapidly is, you know, that we are consuming so much of this on an annual basis. And the, and the reason why we are consuming it is that it basically improves our quality of life. It does contribute to sustainable development. So, so there is a big need for those, uh, for those, for those uh, you know, products. However, while, while the amount of you know, like recycling capacity and also you know, legislation throughout the world is not you know, keeping up with the, uh, w with the big growth of this e-waste. Global warming is just one issue cited by the report. As it noted, 98 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalents were released into the atmosphere as a result of inadequate recycling of undocumented refrigerators and air conditioners. Coronavirus lockdowns have exacerbated the e-waste problem. This is not yet reflected uh, in the global e-waste monitor, but we can likely expect also an increase due to the COVID crisis because all of us are doing now homework or homeschooling. And for this, we require technology at the end of the day. So uh, it was surprising to, to many of us that many equipment was quickly sold out when the lockdowns appeared as such. But in the same way, we can expect also a rising, increasing uh, mountain of e-waste. Since 2014, the number of countries that have adopted a national e-waste policy, legislation or regulation, has increased from 61 to 78. However, regulatory advances in some regions are slow, enforcement is poor, and policy legislation or regulation does not yet stimulate the collection and proper management of e-waste due to lack of investment and political motivation. A total of 50 tons of mercury and 71 kilotons of brominated flame retardant, also known as BFR plastics, are found in globally undocumented flows of e-waste annually, which is largely released into the environment and impacts the health of the exposed workers. A total of 98 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent were released into the atmosphere from discarded fridges and air conditioners that were not managed in an environmentally sound manner. This is approximately 0.3% of global energy-related emissions in 2019. The value of raw materials in the global e-waste generated in 2019 is equal to approximately $57 billion. Iron, copper and gold contribute mostly to this value, with the current documented collection and recycling rate of 17.4%, a raw material value of $10 billion is recovered in an environmental sand wave from e-waste globally, and four metric tons of raw materials could be made available for recycling. The recycling of iron, aluminium, and copper contributed to a net saving of 50 metric tons of carbon dioxide, equivalent to emissions from the recycling of secondary raw materials substituted to virgin materials. In Nigeria, the extended producer responsibility took off with formation of the E-West Producer Responsibility Organization of Nigeria, a non-profit organization set up by electrical and electronic producers in Nigeria. The EPRON is the first producer responsibility organization for electronic waste in Nigeria and was founded in March 2018 with such stakeholders as HP, Dell, Philips, and Microsoft. The way that people are managing the electronic waste is doing harm to themselves and harm to the environment. So Nigerians are dying because of this poor management of electronics. And mind you, e-waste is one of the most hazardous waste streams on the planet. So of all the waste that we should be managing correctly, definitely e-waste is one of them. Adrian Heads, Hinkley in Nigeria. The Recycling Services Department is one of several companies in Nigeria that recover repairable items from waste items for refurbishment and reuse. So we in 2011 took a decision that we have to try and do something to prevent this electronics getting into the wrong hands and being managed informally and put a more formal recycling process into place. And that was how Hinkley Recycling started. 
We've been working closely with the Nigerian government, the federal government, uh, working with Nezrea, working with La Sepa, um, and also the OEM companies that want to take responsible action for their electronics. We're working with these organizations to make sure that we can put the best international practice here in Nigeria for recycling of electronics. And so far, so good. It's, it's going well. Experts have identified the absence of electronic waste laws and regulatory framework in West Africa. Pre disposes countries within the region to indiscriminate dumping of e-waste from the industrialized countries of the world. For instance, most of the imported second-hand computers are almost at the end of their life cycle, and burnt copper wires derived from such computers can cause cancer. The difference between us and the informal sector is that we extract the hazardous material, ensure that those hazardous materials go for further treatment under environmentally friendly practice so that they don't end up in dump sites, don't end up in the illegal dumping sites. And, uh, you know, it's very common in Nigeria to extract copper from cable, that they will take bundles of cable and burn them in open fire. In the process of doing that, they're breathing in a lot of toxins. Uh, those toxins are carcinogenic and can end up causing cancer. It's just for lack of data and statistics, but we know that these things will be causing lung cancer for some of these boys who are burning these cables and trying to extract that value from the material. We're not saying let's not extract the, the value. We should. Let's get the copper out of the cables, but let's make sure that they're not done in an, an illegal, informal manner, which ends up killing people. Electronic goods are made up of hundreds of different materials and containing toxic substances such as lead, mercury, cadmium, arsenic, and flame retardant. An old style cathode ray tube computer screen can contain up to three kilograms of lead. Once in landfill, these toxic materials seep out into the environment, contaminating land, water, and the air. In addition, devices are often dismantled in primitive conditions. Those who work at these sites suffer frequent bouts of illness. In Nigeria, those commonly affected by the harmful act are laborers dismantling their electronic devices, scavengers, as well as members of the public within the vicinity of the landfills. The informal sector don't have to bear the cost of hazardous processing. But one thing in, I'm sure of uh, in Nigeria is that people, particularly households, will not be willing to part of their electronics for free. You know, I'm from the UK and we have um, general recycling sites where we can go and, and drop our electronics TVs and old radios and old mobile phones. And you'll be surprised that in the UK people do just drop it inside a skip, a bin, and it's taken away. And they don't expect any uh, money in return for that. There's no financial incentive. They just want to get it out of their house. It's old. It's an old TV. They don't want it. But in Nigeria, it might not work that way. I don't think households will voluntarily drop TVs and electronics inside a recycling bin for free. So there has to be a financial incentive for people to release their electronics. And the EPR system is, uh, creates that financial incentive so recyclers and collectors can go out and buy some of these electronics uh, from households, uh, from these dump sites, get them out of that informal sector and get them to a responsible recycler. At the moment, in addition to their own exposure to the dangerous chemicals, Nigeria's informal system is leaking hazardous toxins into the groundwater and valuable materials into foreign pockets. The amount of e-waste is expected to almost double from 2014 levels by 2030, as experts expect the demand for electronics followed by their disposal to grow. That's a danger to people's health because the trash can poison people handling it and the surrounding environment. More can be done to enforce policies. And as the exchange of electronics as goods and waste is global, experts have advised that efforts to keep it from piling up to dangerous levels will need to be global too. I'm Ayola Kasim, asking you to join us next week for another episode of the program. In the meantime, do go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash channelsweb, to check this episode and other episodes of the program. You can also send us your comments and questions. at file at channelcv.com is the address. Thank you for spending your time with us.